Text of Study by V. T. Hotef. Sabbath, November 30, 1946. Mount Carmel Chapel, Waco, Texas. I shall read from Mount of Blessings, beginning with the first paragraph on page 170. These pages are based on the scripture, quote, Bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, end quote. Revised Version. Quote, Temptation is enticement to sin, and this does not proceed from God, but from Satan, and from the evil of our own hearts. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempteth no man. Satan seeks to bring us into temptation, that the evil of our characters may be revealed before men and angels, that he may claim us as his own. In the symbolic prophecy of Zechariah, Satan is seen standing at the right hand of the angel of the Lord, accusing Joshua, the high priest, who is clothed in filthy garments and resisting the work that the angel desires to do for him. This represents the attitude of Satan towards every soul whom Christ is seeking to draw unto himself. The enemy leads us into sin, and then he accuses us before the heavenly universe as unworthy of the love of God. But the Lord saith unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And unto Joshua he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. God in his great love is seeking to develop in us the precious graces of his spirit. He permits us to encounter obstacles, persecution, and hardships, not as a curse, but as the greatest blessing of our lives. Every temptation resisted, every trial barely born, gives us a new experience and advances us in the work of character building. The soul that through divine power resists temptation reveals to the world and to the heavenly universe the efficiency of the grace of Christ. But while we are not to be dismayed by trial, bitter though it be, we should pray that God will not permit us to be brought where we shall be drawn away by the desires of our own evil hearts in offering the prayer that Christ has given us. We surrender ourselves to guidance of God, asking Him to lead us in safe paths. We cannot offer this prayer in sincerity and yet decide to walk in any way of our own choosing. We shall wait for his hand to lead us, and shall listen to his voice, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. End quote. Satan cannot do anything against us if our hearts be right. He can succeed only if we make it possible for him to. If we willingly fall when we know better, we thereby let Satan overcome us. Let us not forget that no one can keep on going his own way and that at the same time pray the Lord's Prayer without making a liar of himself. But those who wholeheartedly take the Lord at his word and allow him to direct their paths never go wrong. That we might be this latter class, brethren, should be our prayer at this time. This evening, we are to study the 10th chapter of Zechariah. To find the time of the fulfillment of this prophecy and promises, we need look no further than the first verse of the chapter. Zechariah chapter 10, verse Quote, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. End quote. These figures of speech, you know, are not used by inspiration without reason, and so the term, latter rain, must have its special significance. 
Inspiration chose to use the term latter rain instead of some other term in order to point out that this rain of truth is to do to the people of the harvest time just what the natural rain does to the grain of the field. Without the rain, the people would not be developed for the heavenly garner. They would be good for nothing more than to be blown with the chaff. By the latter rain, then, is symbolized the last shower of truth coming down to fit the people for the heavenly garner, the kingdom. And to this last portion of truth must come as freely to those who live just prior to the harvest as does the rain in the field. Just as soon as this final touch of development is accomplished, the sickle is put to the precious golden grain, and while the fruits are being put into the barn, the tares are left to be burned in the field. Bright clouds scatter their drops of rain to every one grass in the field. Inspiration here uses nature to show that the bright clouds represent truth-conveying agencies which personally reach every prospective truth-seeker. Dark clouds suggest a very heavy and damaging rain that frightens the beholder. Conversely, bright clouds suggest a gentle rain, one which descends lightly in such a way that the ground can absorb all of it. It does not waste itself. Literally speaking, dark clouds would represent publications that are too voluminous for one to welcome or to comprehend. But bright clouds must stand for small, easily comprehended publications of meat in due season that comes in portions which the recipient of them can easily take in, digest, and assimilate. Then, too, this latter rain must fall as freely and as without cost to the recipients as does rain itself fall. Quote, more than 1,000, end quote, attests inspiration, quote, will soon be converted in one day, most of whom will trace their first convictions to the reading of our publications, end quote. Review and Herald, November 10, 1885. Accordingly, along with the world's dark clouds that now hover over those who are pessimistic about the promises of God, there are these bright clouds that hover over those who are optimistic concerning all the promises of God. Yes, we are now living in the time of the latter rain. This is clearly evidenced by the fact that the publications, the bright clouds, are even now laden with the subject of the harvest, the gathering of the saints, and the destroying of the tares. Indeed, this fact is self-evident. And also, brother, sister, you need not listen to the voice that urges you to hide from this gentle rain. You need not tuck yourself under someone's umbrella. Come out and avail yourself of this much-needed shower. It is sent to give you the development which is necessary to fit you for the barn, the kingdom. Delay no longer, lest the angels find you unfit and they cast you into the fire along with the tares. Verse 2, quote, For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. End quote. Here is conveyed the thought that the character-building rain is coming down because the waiting ones have been listening to vanity. But in order that we may know the exact truth herein intended for us, let us carefully consider the main words and phrases of this verse of Scripture. First, our attention is called to the idols that speak. But rather than speak the truth, they speak vanity. Also brought to our attention are diviners that have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They try to comfort, but their comfort is in vain. Let us now face the realities. There is no need of our any longer making fools of ourselves. 
why not now admit that this verse of scripture reveals that all of us at one time or another either have ourselves been idols or have been idol worshippers? And then, if we want to be on the Lord's side, we who are of the lady must cease idolizing the ministry. And we who are of the ministry must cease using the Lord's word to exalt ourselves. The lady must follow the Lord and his ever advancing truth. They must not trust in men, but must depend on the spirit of truth to point out the stand which they are to take. They must know the facts for themselves. They must not be, quote, of Paul or Apollos, end quote, but of Christ. The ministers must uplift the Lord and his truth. They must no longer preach self or sermons to gain followers to themselves, but preach inspired sermons of truth to gain converts to Christ. They must instruct their congregations to pray for steadily revealed truth and to readily accept it regardless through whom it comes. The ministers must ever be on guard against allowing themselves to be made idols. This they can do, as I said, by no longer preaching self, but preaching Christ. Only in this way can they avoid becoming everlasting idols laid in tombs, and succeed in becoming servers of meat in due season, and everlasting saints in his kingdom. This is what Zechariah chapter 10 verse 2 teaches, and this is what we must do if we want to live after the sinners perish. How true indeed that there is no real shepherd anywhere, and the people have gone their own way. Let us eliminate this condition by arising to the occasion as the Lord's revealed truth suggests. Verse 3, quote, Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. End quote. Yes, the Lord is patient and merciful, but he knows when one passes over the limit of his graces. He keeps time, and in due season he gives us our meat. The goats, those who are found on his left, Matthew 25, verse 33, will have their reward. Why? Because the Lord of hosts has visited his people, the house of Judah. He has brought to them the latter rain, the meat in due season. He has trained them for his great work. Verse 4, quote, Out of him came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. End quote. The Lord himself chooses from Judah the corner stone founder, the nail organizer, the bow, the truth or instrument by which to gain the victory over the enemy, and every oppressor, ruler. With these he builds the house of Judah. Verse 5, quote, and they shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight, because the Lord is with them, and their riders on horses shall be confounded. End quote. Those whom the Lord visits will without doubt win this great spiritual conflict. The victory shall be so complete that even the demons who lead our enemies in their conflict will themselves be confounded. Verse 6, quote, And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. End quote. The statement, quote, I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, end quote, implies that the house of Judah is saved before the house of Joseph. You see, the former need only to be strengthened, while the latter need be saved. Nevertheless, both are brought into one place. The Lord extends this favor to both of them, 
because he has mercy upon them and will treat them as though they had never caused him to cast them out. Verse 7, quote, And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. End quote. Ephraim's joy shall be as is the effect of wine. The children shall see the joy and the change in their fathers, and as the result, they too will rejoice in the Lord. Truly, quote, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. End quote. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Quote, verse 8. Quote, I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. End quote. The saints shall hear a certain sound, and by it shall the Lord gather them, for he has redeemed them. They shall increase. The gathering of the people will continue. To the first fruits shall be added the second fruits. Verse 9, quote, And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. End quote. That is, he will multiply them by sending the first fruits, those that escape of the slain of the Lord, as missionaries among those who have not as yet heard of his fame or seen his glory. These escaped ones shall bring all their brethren to the house of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 16, 19, and 20. They, with their families, shall turn again to their homeland. Verse 10, quote, I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt, and gather them out of Assyria, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and place shall not be found for them. End quote. The elect shall be gathered from everywhere, and shall spread as far as the land of Gilead and Lebanon. But even then, place shall be too small for the multitude. Verse 11, quote, And he shall pass through the sea with affliction, and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. End quote. That is to say, in the strength of the Lord, the great image is smitten in the feet. The reign of sin is brought to an end. Verse 12, quote, And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. End quote.